Welcome back, cinephiles. Here, we pick up where we left off in part 1. If you haven't seen part 1 yet, check it out by clicking the card here. Today, we'll take a look at the performances of Beatrice Strait, Robert Duvall, Ned Beatty, Marlene Warfield, Kathy Cronkite, and Arthur Burkhart. This is Making Film. Beatrice Strait had only been in a few movies by this time, but she had starred in many plays on Broadway. Producer Howard Gottfried said, When she came in to read for the part, she had us weeping. Script supervisor Kate Chapin noted during the last day of rehearsal, which focused mostly on the winter romance scene, Strait gave a quote, printable performance, with tears and all. Nearly all of Beatrice Strait's screen time was in the winter romance scene, where Max tells his wife that he has been having an affair with Diana and he thinks that he is in love with her. The dialogue is grand and eloquent, perhaps more so than you'd expect in real life, but it works. This scene was filmed in one day, on Wednesday, February 4th, at apartment 9F of the Apthorpe building at 390 West End Avenue. The scene, quote, consists of a master shot filmed in a continuous take, which was performed twice, and 12 coverage shots filmed from various angles, most of which were performed about two or three times each. While the most complicated shot here, where Strait gets up and walks around the apartment, ultimately ending in the foyer, was repeated a total of nine times, more than any other shot in the film. There was a specific reason for this besides the difficulties in camera work. I knew that she had to get past a certain point of really almost exhaustion before she'd hit it right. And the only way you do that is by shooting and shooting and shooting. And I remember it was very charming because uh, after about the third take and she was getting bigger and bigger and chewing the scenery. And Patty came over and he said, Sydney, that's much too big. I said, Patty, you know about comedy, I know about divorce. Go sit down, you, it'll be all right. Lamette was nearing his third divorce at the time Network was made. Around take six or seven, the scene began to take shape. Lamette wanted a quote, emotional through line to it, but it had to have a shape. In working out the scene on the day, they decided that the shape of the scene will start with a burst of energy, and then the energy, as well as the tempo, slowly drains by the end of it, much like these moments in real life. Oh, say something for God's sake. I really think that this scene could work as a standalone short film. It perfectly illustrates their relationship. They've been together such a long time that after an explosion of conflict, they can fall into the same emotional wavelength. Louise has been betrayed, but she can still find empathy with Max, and knows that it isn't his intention to hurt her. There are a few issues with the scene in the editing room. The first was that a mispronunciation of Emeritus had somehow slipped by. Strait had been saying, Emeritus years. I can totally relate to this. But editor Alan Heim managed to catch this in the edit, despite never having heard the word pronounced before. Something just didn't seem right about the line. So that line became one of the very few lines of dialogue to be dubbed over in the finished film. You can hear the difference in audio quality here. Your last roar of passion before you settle into your emeritus years. Is that what's left for me? The second issue was much worse. In the screenplay, the winter romance scene takes place after Max and Diana's getaway, which during the assembly seemed to Chayefsky, Gottfried, and Lamette to be all wrong. They felt that the winter romance scene was slowing things down. They actually came very close to cutting the scene altogether, if not for Haim making, quote, a last ditch plea to preserve it by having the motel love scene come first. It's crazy to think that this scene, which earned Beatrice Strait the Best Supporting Actress Oscar, almost didn't make it in the film. For the role of Frank Hackett, Lamette didn't want to cast a New Yorker or someone who seemed sophisticated. At this time, a role like Frank was a departure for Robert Duvall. This was after he played Hagen in The Godfather, but before he played Kilgore in Apocalypse Now. Perhaps his role in Network was partially responsible for his casting in Apocalypse Now. Duvall was a last minute idea, and Lamette said that he didn't know why he thought of Duvall because he's not the kind of guy you'd imagine wearing a tuxedo. Dunaway said that it was fun to act with Duvall because as an actor, he never lies. Everything is happening to him and not just the character he is playing. Duvall also never spoke in the third person when talking about his character. He wouldn't say Hackett would do this, but instead, I would do this. Duvall also got into character in a very interesting way. He would occasionally open up the office window and just yell at people walking down below. And one time he dropped his pants and mooned somebody on the street before a take. Duvall is also hilarious in this role. I love this part where he interrupts the man he just asked to speak. As of this minute, over 14,000 telegrams, the response is sensational. Herb telling. Herb's phone has to stop ringing. Every goddamn affiliate from Albuquerque to Sandusky. So 
people. I needed actors that, you know, could be funny without having to be funny, uh, who understood the nature of comedy, which is that it's, it has to look like it's perfectly natural, but it's not perfectly natural. It's a very tough, tiny, hard line to follow. All of Duvall's performance in the scene after Howard Beale stops the CCA deal was take one. Two billion dollars isn't peak! That's the wrath of God! And the wrath of God wants Howard Beale fine! Ned Beatty wasn't the first choice to play Arthur Jensen. In fact, they had cast a different actor, but it became apparent during the rehearsal that the original actor couldn't give them what they wanted. It was actually Robert Altman who suggested Ned Beatty during a lunch with Howard Gottfried. Beatty was cast three days before they were to shoot his big primal forces of nature scene. You have meddled with the primal forces of nature, Mr. Beale, and I won't have it! He flew out, memorizing his four-page speech on the plane. He met with Lamette on a Sunday, and they were shooting the scene on Monday. He was very nervous because of the pressure on him not only to perform, but to know every word exactly as Chayefsky had written it. Beatty had done Shakespeare and approached the scene as if you were in a Shakespeare play. I never will forget looking at the pages, and there were speeches like that. And everybody was very nervous about this. Beatty was nominated for a Best Supporting Actor Oscar for this scene. They were all set to shoot this scene in a boardroom at the New York Stock Exchange building. But the request was denied after reading the portion of the script where Jensen says, there is no America and no democracy. Instead, only a handful of corporations that run everything. The scene ended up being shot at the New York Public Library, which has a Beau Arts boardroom and a grand lobby that they would use as the lobby for CCA. The light is impending! I bear witness to the light! The New York Public Library had a large amount of restrictions for using the boardroom. They weren't allowed to bring any external lights or riggings into the room. Those lamps on the table and the candelabra were already there when they arrived. Cinematographer Owen Roisman said, You'd have to put smoke in the room and backlight the smoke to give rays of light. And I couldn't do any of those things. They wouldn't allow us to use smoke or anything like that. However, you'll notice that there is a spotlight on Jensen during the scene. Roisman said, I basically begged to hang one light on a post at the far end of the table to light Beatty at the other end. It's one of the only scenes where I wasn't crazy about what I did with that. The light was okay, but I think I overexposed it a little too much. You can see how strange it seems that such a powerful performance is done pretty much entirely in a long shot. This scene has a very theatrical feeling. Beatty has to project like he's on a stage. And you will atone. I imagine that if the camera had been cutting around to closer angles of Jensen, it would lose its power. We would get the sense that the film is trying to make the performance big, instead of understanding that it is Jensen who is trying to make his speech feel big. The desk lamps provide a nice visual line to Jensen, but they themselves are imposing, and act as the eyes of the faceless corporations constantly watching every move Beale makes. Beatty threw himself into the scene, occasionally trying to make Peter Finch crack up at his theatrics. He even went as far as one point jumping up onto the table to shout his lines. After the day was over, Beatty asked Chayefsky how the shoot went. Beatty said, without moving a single muscle anywhere on his body, Chayefsky replied, It's okay. The part of Lorraine Hobbs went to Marlene Warfield, whom they knew from the Great White Hope in an incident in which she bit a police officer in London. In the scene where Hobbs meets Diana in Los Angeles, which was actually shot in Long Island, New York, Lamette in his direction reminded Warfield of a satire titled The Blacks, in which, quote, an all-black cast of characters includes a royal court and queen dressed in white masks or white face makeup. As it turns out, Warfield was in a run of the blacks in the East Village during the 60s. Lamette told Warfield, you are the black queen and there is the white queen. Warfield said, he hit it, man. He hit it right on the button when he said that's what this is about. And from then on, we did the scene. That's all he had to say. Warfield also noted that Lamette must have seen the blacks listed in her resume and thought that it was a stroke of genius to bring it up in his direction. This character alludes to Patty Hearst, granddaughter of publishing giant William Randolph Hearst, who was the inspiration for Citizen Kane. Patty Hearst was kidnapped by a radical group called the Symbionese Liberation Army, and was found to have participated in a bank robbery conducted by the group. She claimed in court that the group sexually assaulted her, threatened to kill her, and brainwashed her into participating. Patty Hearst is actually referenced in the movie. That's not the one that kidnapped Patty Hearst. No, no, that's the Symbionese Liberation Army. This is the Ecumenical Liberation Army. What's interesting is that this character is played by Kathy Cronkite, the daughter of iconic newscaster Walter Cronkite. This adds another layer to the film's satire of the news business. 
and Kathy Cronkite herself had to worry about the possibility of getting kidnapped due to her father's fame. Chayefsky's script was full of tongue twisters, but one particular line was quite a mouthful for Cronkite, who was less experienced than most of her co-stars. The line is this. Fuggin' fascist. Have you seen the movies we took of the San Marino jail breakout demonstrating the rising of a seminal prisoner class infrastructure? Here's the clip in the film. Cronkite said, I'm coming down the stairs screaming this line of propaganda that is so rich in politics and so convoluted and not that accessible to me. This is not something that I identify with or empathize with. Particularly when I'm coming in with that passion, all I really want to say is F you, F you. I don't want to be spouting multisyllabic propaganda. And it was very difficult to get the words out. I remember saying to Patty, look, can we just say this instead? Cronkite says this will haunt her for the rest of her life. Cronkite goes on to say, they just said, well, no, but they didn't make me feel dumb or embarrassed or out of line. They just basically said, well, let's try it again the way it is. Sydney had an amazing way of saying you screwed up so that you felt you were the greatest thing in the world. He had this amazing way of saying, oh my God, that was fabulous. How about if we try it again and just tweak it a little? The film portrays the fictional ecumenical liberation army led by the great Ahmed Khan. Khan was played by Arthur Burghardt, who only two years before Network was serving time in prison for draft evasion. He had been transferred to a maximum security prison, and during a peaceful protest, he was maced and beaten in his cell and placed in solitary confinement for 15 months. I mention this because he was unsure about taking on the role of Khan because he thought it might reflect poorly on people who look like him. Burghardt is a big guy. Khan is a criminal robbing banks and causing chaos, and he ultimately commits a televised murder in the film. However, his hesitance to take on the role was not apparent during his audition, in which he burst open the door brandishing a toy gun and threatening everybody in the room. Burghardt said, I went in looking very much like a deposed street punk gangster in the garb of a revolutionary gorilla. I think I put a toothpick in my mouth. I always believe in going into auditions looking like the part, and I thought this may be something. The stunt worked. Howard Gottfried remarked, We looked at this guy and we thought, that's the kind of guy we wanted. Burkhart made a point to use the film satire to comment on the stereotype. He said, I decided I played the archetype to the hilt. He was still pretty sure that he would never work again, citing that quote, Black people won't like me doing this role. People on television won't want me in television. Nevertheless, he went for it, opting to play this scene while filling his mouth with fried chicken. At one point when he said this line, What the fuck are you talking about? Chicken flew out of his mouth and landed on the side of Cronkite's face. He was embarrassed, but Lamette said that he liked it. It should also be noted that Burghardt is a vegetarian and very health conscious. So take after take, he would do the scene and then spit the chicken into a bucket and wipe his mouth out. At one point, the chicken was running low. So Burghardt had the idea to stuff his cheeks with wads of toilet paper to get the look of a man gorging himself on chicken. The performances in Network are so engaging because the script beautifully sets up conflict. Louise wants Max, Max wants Diana, Diana wants to use Howard Beale to make a hit show. Lorraine Hobbs wants Howard's success to set up a time slot for her show. Howard Beale wants to stop the CCA deal. Hackett wants to keep Arthur Jensen and CCA happy, and Jensen wants to push forward the CCA deal. Lamette took a theater approach, which worked well for such a dialogue-heavy script. The environment Lamette created during the making of Network favored the actors above everything. There's interesting stuff happening with the cinematography, but there's nothing to detract from the performances. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in helping this channel grow, share this video on your social media platforms or pledge as little as $1 to my Patreon and get early access to videos, vote on video topics like this one, and much more. And if you're new here, please hit that subscribe button now because there are plenty more videos on the way for cinephiles like you. Thanks again for watching.